Hey everybody, welcome back to Dee's Workshop. I'm Dee's. This is my workshop. Today is going to be another top 10 type video. In this case, it's going to be a top 10 immediate purchases once you buy a, a mini lathe. The things you're going to get right away. You might as well add them to the cart once you put this thing in the cart. I'm going to go through my list of the top 10 things that I bought within a week, I would say, of purchasing my mini lathe. So we're going to go through that list. Hopefully you find this useful and you're able to get some tips and tricks and save yourself a little bit of headache, waiting two or three weeks before you get the materials you need just to get started with this thing. So let's get started with the list. Number one. You're going to want to get digital calipers. I know you can get vernier calipers, you can get other measuring instruments, you can use micrometers, but the ease and lack of learning curve, really, that there is with a good set of digital calipers is going to be something that you want to get. Number one on your list should be just add it to the cart. Buy it now. You can use it for things beyond mini lathes. You can use it in everyday life. Life. Get some digital calipers. Now, you can spend hundreds of dollars on Mitutoyu, Starrett. I ended up originally purchasing some really terrible quality. It was a uh, plastic, I think it was $9.99 on Amazon. I thought this would be good enough. It measured in the hundredths. I'll grab it here. I'll even show you. Measured in the hundredths, and I quickly found out that is not adequate. You'll find these things for very cheap less than 10 bucks on eBay or uh, Amazon. They work. Well, of course the battery's dead in this one. It does work, but it only measures into the hundreds. So what I did was I looked and I found, this I believe was around $30. This is Nico brand, Nico, Nico. It doesn't matter, I'm not promoting any of this. It's stainless steel and it measures up to a half a 10th. So this is far more accurate. I've verified it with micrometers. I've verified it with other measuring instruments. It's, it's, it is very good for my needs and it's pretty spot on. So you just need to accept that you want, you're gonna wanna buy this day one. If you don't have any digital calipers, you're gonna wanna get these day one. If you, if you don't want digital and you wanna go with veneer, that's fine, but you need to get a good set of calipers. That's number one on the list. Number two. Raw materials. You need raw materials right away. What are you gonna turn? You can turn bolts. That's what I did, nuts and you know, screws. Some bolts that I had around just to see what I could do. Quickly, you're going to say, I want to make a thing. I want to make this project. I want to make a hammer face. I want to make uh, a hammer, you know, a machinist hammer, a little tappy tap thing. Well, you don't, you're going to need raw materials to do that. So right away, you're going to find yourself needing some raw materials. There's many ways that you can do that. You can go scour your salvage yards. A lot of times they're going to have some recycled equipment, recycled things. If you're throwing things out, Think to yourself, before I just chuck this in the garbage, what kind of material is inside this thing? Like a laser printer, for instance, there, or a, a desk jet printer. There's going to be some precision ground rods in those where, where your print heads ride back and forth, for instance. All kinds of other things. Uh, axles off of, off of garbage cans. Just silly things. Uh, if you got an old wagon that you're going to throw in the trash. That's what this is. This right here. Really hefty chunk of steel. It's an axle off of an old garbage can. Now, I'm not saying that you should buy, you should use total crap for all your future projects. But when you're starting out and you're trying to learn and you're trying to get some materials to turn and just understand the machine and just get used to it, use some crappy materials, some recycled stuff so you can learn how to, to turn and learn how the machine works. So that's number two. Raw materials. Number three.
you are going to want a drill chuck for that tailstock immediately. If it doesn't come with one, you're going to buy it right away. You need a drill chuck. You got to figure out your Morris taper that comes with the tailstock you bought. But you are going to need, you're going to use this all the time, you need a drill chuck for that tailstock. So, that's going to be your number three purchase. Number four. I could probably morph that one into it, but you're going to need a live center. You need a live center for that tailstock. Number four, live center for the tailstock. You're, anything that you stick out of this, this lathe chuck that's any distance at all, you're going to want to shore it up using your tailstock, and you're going to want to be able to secure that piece so that when you're turning larger diameters or longer work pieces, you have some support out on the end or you're never going to come out with a good finish or a properly sized work piece. That's number four. Number five. You can see it from here. Quick change tool post. Now, some of you might say, ah, oh, the one that comes with it's fine. The one that came with it is fine, but what I quickly found was to center your cutting tool, you have to use shims. There, there's no adjustment screw, there's no way to quickly center your cutting tool to your workpiece. So you gotta get some shims and figure that out. I, I made it work, I used just some piece of aluminum and scrap stock that I have. People say you can cut up aluminum can and use that as shim stock. It was a hassle, I didn't like it. I quickly went to a quick change tool post. The first one I had was a really small one. I think it was 0XA is the size. It was aluminum. I didn't know what I was doing. I drilled out the bottom. I made it work, but it wasn't very substantial. It would move and shift and bind up. I didn't care for that one. It was too small. I felt it was too small for this lathe. Shortly after, I upgraded to an AXA style quick change tool post. With that, I'm able to get tool holders, I'm able to quickly adjust the height of the tooling, and I'm able to center that right up on the work pieces, and it's repeatable every time. Quick change tool post, number five. Quick change tool post. Let's move to number six. Number six. Carbide insert tooling. You are going to want to get carbide inserts. I don't use these 100% of the time, but the ease of putting these things in and they're sharp, you, you rotate it and you got a new corner, another sharp, you get three corners, sharp corners out of these things. They got chip breakers built into them. They're really easy to use. They work really well. When you buy the sets, they come with little wrenches so you can change them out. They work in your quick change tool post holders. It's, it's something that you're going to want because you can get these in varying shapes, sizes, depths, all of that. I highly recommend that you, you, you get those right away. You're going to immediately purchase that stuff. There's just no way around it. That's what you're going to do. Number seven. Number seven. Lubricants, you're going to want cutting fluid. When you start cutting like aluminum or some of the, if you're doing a center drill or threading, especially threading or parting off using a parting blade, you need cutting fluid. You are also going to need whey oil to lubricate your whey beds, your ways. You're going to need whey oil for the tailstock, because it, it rides along there, your compound, all that stuff, you need to keep it lubricated. You gotta keep this thing oiled up. It's rust prevention, but it also keeps everything sliding. Lubricants, uh, oil cans to go along with that. That's not a, another number, that, that goes with it. You're gonna need a way to dispense the oil. Get some oil cans, that goes along with it. Here's some cutting fluid. This is Drill Hog, I don't, I don't promote these, I just bought it. It's really thick cutting oil. I really like it. This was recommended to me by Dave. I agree with him. This is good stuff. 
Little goes a long way too. You don't need to buy a, a gallon of this stuff. Uh, cutting fluid for aluminum or just surface finishes to keep things cool. I got a little dispenser here now. Cutting fluid. I made that. That's uh, half, well, one part kerosene, two parts uh, hydraulic fluid. ISO 68, I think is the name of it, is, is what it is. That's lubricants. You're going to need lubricants day one, immediately. You're going to need them. Number eight. Number eight. A full drill bit set. A full drill set. You're not going to be able to get away with, like, just the the ran, standard range of of drills that when you work with with wood around the home and that sort of thing like hang on like uh you know i've been using this for years but this is not near enough tools not near enough drills for when you're working with metal you got to be able to drill closer to your especially if you're doing a tapping you need some accurate drills and you need them to be closer to your size. Look at getting a full drill set. You can likely get away with, I mean, there's there's letter drills, there's number drills, there's metric, there's imperial, there's SAE. I opted to go with a full drill set SAE and I didn't get metric and I certainly didn't buy the letter drills. You, you can spend a lot of money but there's like Kleeline and there's some other brands that make really good high quality drills. Do your research, get a good quality drill set. And more importantly, dedicate it to your metal machining. Dedicate it to your workshop, your lathe shop. Don't go using it on concrete and drywall and crap around the house. Use your other sets for that. Dedicate it and leave it for your metal machining. Make those drills last as long as you can. And to go along with the drills, get yourself, you're, immediately you're gonna want some center drills. Center drill bits. You're gonna find that there's a, a smaller size that you use more often than not with this size of lathe, but I just bought this from Amazon and it's working out fantastic. Drills, center drills. Number nine, number nine. You're gonna want a deburring tool. Buy a simple deburring tool. This one comes with replaceable, replaceable, uh, well, if I can get that out of there. Replaceable tips. Uh, some will work with nylon, some will work with aluminum, some will work with steel. But at any rate, you can pull these out of here pop in a new one, replace it, throw in a new one. You got plenty of, you know, deburring tool. This is a single use one, throw it away. I'm not sure how to replace these tips. Maybe there's a way. Looks like there's a little pin in there. But anyway, regardless, deburring tool. You're gonna need it. You can use the carbide inserts or some of the carbide, braised carbide for chamfering and that will deburr. But what's difficult is when you're on the inside, the ID, of many of your work pieces. This is just simple. Grab this, deburr it. You need to get those sharp edges off of there. When you're working with materials, if you don't deburr it, some of these edges can be very sharp. It's just what you do. When you're machining, part of it is deburring and using the deburring tool. So, deburring tool, number nine. And finally, number 10. Number 10, you need cleaning supplies. Can't stress this enough. This thing's going to come from some warehouse where it's been stored for a year, two, three, who knows how long. It's going to be full of cosmoline. You can use kerosene to get that off. Other things they don't recommend like brake cleaner because that can actually strip the paint off of these. But you need to be able to degrease and clean these things right out of the box. Beside that, as you're working on piece, work pieces, you're going to want degreaser, you're going to want oil, you're going to want lubricants, you're going to want WD-40, you're going to need all kinds of things to clean this mess up. You have oil everywhere. Shop towels. Get yourself some good shop towels, some shop rags, those disposable kind. 
if you use paper towels, they, they have heavy lint. They're heavy on the lint. You wipe things down, it's just fuzzy lint everywhere. Get those shop rags. They can be the blue ones. They can be the white ones. Uh, you've seen me use pig mats. These are great. These are great for oil absorbency. You can put them underneath your lathe. It, it'll catch all the oil as you're working on different things. If you're if you're tearing apart a carburetor, whatever, it's going to catch that oil, that fuel, that that stuff that you need to soak up, not throw out in the yard. You just dispose of it properly. Chip pan. I use a cookie sheet to catch my chips. It's easy to be able to clean up. That goes along with cleaning supplies, chip brushes, cleaning supplies. These are very vital in order to brush your chips away. You don't want to use your hands because that stuff's sharp. You can cut your fingers. You don't need to be cutting yourself. But cleaning supplies, Scotch-Brite pads, Scotch-Brite for cleaning off maybe a little bit of rust, surface rust, things like that. Regardless, cleaning supplies. You need to buy it. You will buy it right away. With that, though, that brings me to the top 10 immediate purchases that you're going to make after you buy your first mini lathe, benchtop lathe, whatever you name it, even if you buy a mill. All the things that I referenced in this particular video is probably going to be relevant to any metal machining equipment that you first purchase, especially if you didn't come from a background where you already had this stuff. With that, I hope you enjoyed. I hope you find this useful. If you, have, if you haven't subscribed, please do so. I'm really trying to grow the channel. Every time somebody subscribes, it makes me happy. I love your comments down there. You guys are teaching me things every time I post a video. I appreciate every one of you. I hope you enjoyed, and I hope to see you on the next one. Thanks for watching.